like. But today we're in chapter 22, and I want to share with you out of verses 35 through 38 here in the uh, Gospel of Luke. And so let's begin reading here in Luke chapter 22 at verse 35. I'll read to verse 38. We'll get into our study. And this really looks at, at the Lord continuing to equip his, his men for for the service that they're going to be um, rendering unto him as they go forth with his gospel. So beginning at verse 35, reading to verse 38, Luke chapter 22, Luke writes, He said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, Nothing. Then he said to them, But now, he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. And so what we have here as we pick up here in Luke chapter 22 at verse 35 is we have Jesus reminding his disciples concerning their previous ministry experiences. He's preparing them because he's about to depart from them. And so what he's doing is he's reinforcing earlier lessons. And he's referring to something that we can see not only in Luke's gospel. We saw this earlier as we studied Luke. But you can also see what he's referring to in the Gospel of Matthew. And so what I want to do is I want to lay a context for you so you can understand, so we together can understand what he's saying. And so I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. And I'm going to highlight a few of the things that Jesus was uh, speaking of there, teaching them. And uh, I want to use that as the platform in which we apply the verses before us today here in Luke 22. And so we'll look at Matthew chapter 10 for a moment because that records how Jesus had sent them out on their first ministry trip. See, Matthew 10 uh, records that. He had, in chapter 10, appointed the 12 whom we know as uh, the 12 apostles. And, and Matthew chapter 10 is real early in his ministry. And so what he's doing in Matthew 10 and what he's referring to later on in Luke 22 will be the lessons that he initially gave to them when he originally was calling them and sending them out. And this is very early in his ministry, right as he was starting to train them to be ministers. And, and so they need to remember something. They, re, they need to remember that they have been chosen. They've been selected by God to take a message out to the world. And so he wants to remind them because he's about to depart. Jesus in Luke 22 is giving final instructions. But it's interesting how he refers back to earlier instructions in order that he might prepare them for future ministry. And so I want to look at a few of those things that he was teaching them here in Matthew chapter 10. We need to remember first and foremost that in chapter 10, as it says here in verse 1, he had called his 12 disciples to them. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And so I want to begin by, by reminding you that he chose them. That's how ministry begins. It's through the choosing of the Lord. And so as he's telling them something concerning what he'd already trained them in, we need to remember that he's the one who chose them. Now, in John chapter 15, if you take notes, it's found in verse 16. In John chapter 15, verse 16, that night he'd already reminded them concerning his choosing, and he had said in John 15, verse 16, you didn't choose me, I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will remain. And so Jesus is reminding them that they were not searching him out, he actually sought them out. Jesus wasn't lost. They were. So Jesus is the one who seeks out the lost. And so he's reminding them, and he's already reminded them here in the, the passage that we'll be looking at. He's already reminding them that he had chosen them, and they need to remember that. They need to remember a few very important things in order that they might properly serve the Lord. And these are the things that I want to look at with you so we can lay a foundation in order that we can understand what he's saying in Luke chapter 22. We need to remember that he's about to leave them, but they're going to continue the work that he has begun through them on earth. So in order for them to be successful, they need to remember some very, very basic things. And we see some of those things here in Matthew chapter 10. The first thing I want to remind you of in chapter 10 would be found in verse 1. 
The first thing, if you want to be used by the Lord, that, that you need to be reminded of, that I need to be reminded of, if I want to be used by the Lord, is I need to remember who I am. And, and I would point out that the men that he called, and, and he actually names them for us here in, in verses 2 through, uh, through 4, the names of these men, well, I'd, I'd like to remind you that these were unspectacular men. These were ordinary men. And so that, from the very beginning, should let us know that God chooses to use the ordinary to do extraordinary things. God has a way of doing that. He goes in and, and reaches those who are of the lowest level, if you will, the base, those who are not noble, those who are not well-educated in the things of the world and all of that. God has a tendency of reaching and using ordinary people. He uses ordinary people to reach other people. And so Jesus is the one who is calling these people to himself. And, and they need to remember that they are ordinary men. When you read the names of these disciples, and, and we could do that, but you already know them. You've read them several times yourself. You'll notice there's nothing spectacular about any of them. Whenever you see the list of the apostles being enumerated for us, you'll always note that, that Simon Peter's name is always at the beginning, and when Judas is included, Judas Iscariot is always at the conclusion. You see Simon Peter the first mentioned, and you'll, you'll see Judas as the last mentioned because Judas was the betrayer. But when you look at these guys, not a single one of them stands out. Every one of them is just a basic, ordinary person. So the first thing that I'd like to remind all of us of is if God is going to use us, we need to remember that we're just ordinary people with an extraordinary God, which produces within us something called humility. God gives to us a call, and we know that we are just basic, ordinary people. And so when you have humility, that is very definitely a need for us if we're going to be successful in taking the Word of God out. Humility is necessary for proper preaching. And that's because true power, true power is, is in God. The true power is in His message. And these disciples who are about to go out into all the world to preach this gospel, need to remember that. They need to remember who they are. In 2 Corinthians, if you take notes, it's found in chapter 4, verse 7, very powerful scripture. Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not of ourselves. This power isn't self-generated. We, we are just clay pots. We are just ordinary vessels, vessels that are used for ordinary tasks in a day. That's all we are. The excellence is not in the clay pot. The excellence is in what that clay pot contains. Years ago, I was talking to my wife, and and I was talking to her a little bit about perfumes and things. And I thought that if I talked to her about perfumes, I wouldn't have to buy her any, but I was wrong. But anyway, as, <laughs> as we were talking a little bit about um, perfumes and all, I, I said to her, I said, Hun, does it really matter what the vessel looks like? Does it matter what the vessel looks like to make the perfume valuable or you know, cheap. I mean, does, 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 does a vessel have anything to do with it? And she says, no, a vessel doesn't have anything to do with it. It isn't the vessel. It's, it's what's inside of that vessel. She says, but something else you need to remember. She said, the one who makes that perfume, that you need to remember the maker of that perfume. Now, see, that's a woman's insight. See, I wouldn't have a clue what that means, but she sure did, you know, because I thought, man, if I go to the swap meet and get a gallon of this stuff, it's pretty good, man. <laughs> She said, nope, doesn't work that way. She says, you need to know that it's not the vessel itself. It's, it's the perfume, but the perfume itself actually has a creator. And isn't that the way it is with us? I mean, here we are. We have a tendency, human beings have a tendency of giving an awful lot of attention to the vessel, to the vessel, to the person, the personality, instead of giving all the attention to the maker. And, and if we understand that, if we understand that all we are are clay pots. Some have called us crack pots. That's all we are. All we are are clay pots. But it's God who actually is the one who puts within us that which is valuable. And if we understand that, if we understand the message and the maker is what we carry within us, the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the gospel, 
And if we understand that we are first partakers of that which we give to others, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, that which I have received, I've delivered unto you. If we understand that we are those who have first received from the Lord and simply give that which we have received ourselves, and if we remember where we were when we received that, in what condition, what a state of our life was at that time, how we were, what was going on in us, then all we are is, is somebody who is very thirsty telling somebody else where they can get a good drink of water. That's all we really are. And the Holy Spirit working within, within us uh, is, is going to use us to draw people to the Lord Jesus Christ. So they need to remember who they are. They're ordinary people. When they understand and remember that they're simply ordinary people serving an extraordinary God, they can be used in unusual ways. And, and so that knowledge is going to keep them humble as they take his message to the world. And, and, and Jesus is wanting to remind them of these things. And so he's giving to them a reminder. He's about to leave them, so he's, he's having them remember first lessons. They need to remember how he had prepared them to succeed in their mission. Because as they remember who they were, they also need to remember that he's the one who gives them power. Notice again in verse 1 how it says, when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power. And so that's another thing that we need to understand and remember, that we need his power. We need to remember that it's the Lord who gives us the power to succeed. You see, again, on that night, that very night, Jesus had once again reminded them of their need for his power in their life. Uh, in John, in chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, he had said to them, I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, dwells with you and will be in you. That's how we were born again, is we received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We said, God, be merciful unto me. I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. As I've heard this gospel message, and it declares that you are a righteous God and that you can have no fellowship with sin, and yet you have bridged that gap between a sinful man and your own holiness by sending your son Jesus Christ to take upon himself the just penalty for my sin, because the wages of sin is death, Jesus died on a cross for me, poured out his blood for me as a ransom. And I believe that. I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, not just intellectually, not just in my mind where I've embraced certain philosophic thoughts or, or perhaps I've agreed, uh, in, in, at least in, in essence, with, with what is stated here in the gospel. I actually have asked Christ Jesus to forgive my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness and to enter into my life. And like, like Paul said, I've become the temple of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God now dwells within me. And, and so it's not just head knowledge. It, it's, it's now a life knowledge. It's an experience with God that, that goes beyond denominationalism. It goes to relationship with God himself through the Son, Jesus Christ. And so what happens is, if I'm going to be used by the Lord, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I need to remember who I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But I also need to have the power of the Spirit in my life resident within me. And they needed to understand and remember that. So he's calling them to cast their attention back on what he's already taught them before. You're ordinary people, and unspectacular in every way, but you've been with me. And I have given to you authority that you might do works in my name. Not only did he do that, he's also going to remind them of the fact that he calls them, but also sends them to a certain, certain place. In other words, they have a mission. Notice verse 5. In chapter 10 here in Matthew, it says, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And, and so he gave them a target. To be successful, he, he, he gave them a spiritual priority, a ministry. They had a goal. They, they were to go first to the Jewish nation. They were to go to God's lost sheep. So he's reminding them that their ministry is, is to the house of Israel first. In, in Jeremiah, in, in chapter 50, verse 6, uh, the Lord God said, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, caused them to roam on the mountains. 
They wandered over mountain and hill and forgot their own resting place. The Lord God in the Old Testament speaks of the nation of Israel as a group of sheep who are lost. And, and so Jesus initially had sent them to do ministry to the house of Israel. And he's reminding them that it's to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. In Acts, in, in chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says to them, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You will be primarily a minister reaching first the city of Jerusalem and then southern Israel, Judea. You'll go into the central-ish area called Samaria, but you're going to go throughout the world taking this message to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. He said, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so Jesus had said, listen, you have a spiritual target. You have a priority. Go out and take this message out to the people. Then he gave to them a method. They were to go out and they were to preach. Notice verse 7. He says, as you go, preach. And so there's something that they're to do. They're to take this message and they're to speak it forth. They're to, to preach. They're called to preach the Word of God. You know, uh, without going into this in too much detail, the word preach today is really a, a negative for many people. They think it's a negative thing. But the word preach actually speaks of, pro, of something that's great. It's profound. It's deep. It's wonderful. It, it's, it's a communication of something that is really enormously special. It's a proclamation of good news. And so he says, I'm going to give to you a, a, a methodology of doing this. And, and what I want you to do is I want you to go forth and I want you to declare the good news. I want you to let people know all about it. You're to preach. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, Paul said, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But he goes on to say, how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How is it possible for them to get saved if no one is willing to go and speak to them? And how do they receive salvation? Through preaching. But, but not just talking, giving a message. Notice he's, he gives them a message. And the message in verse 7 here in Matthew 10 is the kingdom of God is at hand. And so he says, you have a target group, you have a method, but you also have a message. And this message, by the way, is to be given with a sense of urgency. The most effective ministers are the ones who believe in the message they're giving and have a sense of urgency related to it. Well-known preacher of another day by the name of D.L. Moody, very famous evangelist, ministered in Chicago. On one service, had concluded his message and had said to the congregation, I want you to go home. And I want you to think about the things that you just heard. And then next week when you come back, if the Lord has worked on your heart for you to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I'm going to ask you at that time to come and give your heart to Jesus Christ. And he dismissed his congregation that night and never saw them again because that is the night that the Chicago fire that destroyed the city of Chicago broke out. He didn't see his congregation again. And after that took place, D.L. DL Moody made the statement that he would never close another one of his messages without giving people that night an opportunity to get right with God. There has to be a sense of urgency in you. And, and I guess, you know, as I'm speaking, obviously we're doing a Bible study and all, and you're here because you want to know the things of the Lord. And so I would guess I'm speaking to people who understand that. But sometimes we can, the flame can go out almost. It can become very dim in us. But the bottom line is, is there's this urgency, there's this knowledge that when you're sharing that uh, those people that you're speaking to, if they don't know Christ, they have to come to know him. And there's that sense that you'll have that people will see in you. Sometimes they're turned off by it. They think you're pushy and all, and, and perhaps sometimes we are. But at the same time, they'll see that you're serious about it. In 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, the apostle Paul, when he was writing to a young pastor by the name of Timothy, in verses 2 through 4, said this to him. He said, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. 
Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I was mentioning recently, I spoke at a pastor's conference in Houston a couple of weeks ago, pastors and leaders conference, and I was sharing with them that people have a tendency of, of receiving uh, messages from people who may not even be there teaching the Word of God, but they enjoy their personality. And, and I said, and you know this, in, in, in Texas is the largest church in the United States. And uh, the individual who pastors that church, quote, unquote, uh, does, doesn't teach the Word of God. On one talk show he had been spoken to and was asked concerning the things that he teaches and all from the pulpit. And, and he said, you know, in reality, I'm really not a teacher. What I am is a motivational speaker. And so the largest church in the United States is pastored by a motivational speaker. And a motivational speaker doesn't necessarily have to teach the Word of God. What they're trying to do is just motivate you through common sense and logic and latest books and things like that. And we do have that here in the United States. We are in that time when people do not put up with sound doctrine. There's no doubt about that. We are living in that day right now. And so when you take this word out, you need to understand it's the word that has the ability to transform people's lives. And so you speak it with a, an urgency and a knowledge that God has a way of ministering, especially in these last days when people are heaping into themselves teachers who are telling them what they are itching to hear. He goes on and he says, not only that you're to remember these things, but remember also, in verse 8, remember also that I'm giving to you confirming credentials. God is going to use you, he says in verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. And so there are confirming credentials, the signs and the wonders. They're to demonstrate the, the, the character of God and the nature of his kingdom in the works that they're about to perform. You see, in the kingdom of God, there, 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 are, there are no sick people. The lepers are cleansed. There are no dead. And, and what he was pointing out is, look, at, you're going to show them that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of health and life as you go forth and you do these works. You're going to demonstrate the character of God and the nature of his kingdom. Now, interestingly enough, and I'll say this briefly, but it's something that I hope comes across well to you. I want you to see this with me for a moment. Verse 8, I want, I'm just going to touch on this for a minute. He says, cast out demons. I have a friend of mine who's a pastor in Calvary Chapel in um, Oahu. And I was with him just this last week, and we were sharing, we were talking, and I've known him for a number of years. He's got a good work God's doing there by Pearl Harbor. And... Um, as we were together, he was sharing with me something that, that I thought, I, I want to share that with this congregation. He was sharing with me, and I can't give you all the details because, frankly, I forget them, but I can give you the essentials, how that there was a young woman in his fellowship who actually was a young girl when she first began to come to his church. Her parents loved the Lord, but this young girl was, uh, was a girl who never gave her heart to Christ. She'd come to church because her parents did. But she never opened her heart to the Lord. And when she got old enough to rebel against the family and to leave and all, she did that. And she took off and got into a real, real crazy life. She started doing a lot of drugs and things and, and what basically was dis had disappeared from the church. And then the parents had been praying for her and had been praying for her constantly. And this is over the course of months into years. So she's now growing into young womanhood, but she's into drugs and, and living a terrible life and all. And make a long story into a very short one, she had wanted to get married and, and she called up uh, my friend and said, can you meet with me and my fiancé and all? And because he loves her and knows her and, and wants to minister to her, he says, well, come on into the office. And she comes into the office and, and as he's talking to them, he begins to share with her concerning the things of the Lord and the Spirit of God and and she begins to say to him, she gets angry in front of her, her boyfriend, fiancé, and she begins to say to him things like, um, they didn't hurt Jesus enough. They should have hurt him worse. He didn't go through enough. And her voice begins to change into a deep growl. And right in front of, of him, 
she's manifesting demonic possession. It turns out that, that she's possessed. And, and the things that she's saying, the demons are, are, are speaking through her vocal cords, are vile and blasphemous things, but they're saying he didn't suffer enough, he should have suffered more. And so my friend begins to, to minister to her, and he, and he begins to take authority, even as Jesus here says that you do. And uh, he says, who am I speaking to? And one of them speaks forth, my name is Leviathan. And he casts this demon out, and he says, who am I speaking to? And there's another one there. Long story made short, there's one more who's remaining, going by the name Gabriel. And so he says, who else is there? And the girl says, there's only Gabriel left, but you can't, I don't want him to go. He's my friend. He's been with me for years. I don't want him to go. My pastor friend says, if you're going to be set free, you've got to release. You, you cannot give him permission to remain. And the demon says, she's mine. I don't have to go. And she gets up and she leaves. She says, I want nothing to do with it. She ultimately is, is hospitalized, and she calls him from the hospital. She says, she's trying to get hold of him. He said, I knew that she needed to spend some time in that condition, so I waited. She finally was released, and the first thing she does is she calls me. She says, I need to speak to you. He says, are you ready to receive Christ? She says, I need freedom. I am. He says, come in. She comes into his office, and he says... He begins to speak to her, and the, the demon manifests himself and says to him, I don't have to go. I can remain. And then says this to him, and he says, Dave, he said, when, when this demon said this to me, he said, it just really, it sends chills up your spine. The demon says, you can't win. This world is ours. It belongs to us. You can't have it. Now, in your mind at this moment, you may be saying, that's not true. Maybe you forgot 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Because in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, John says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Maybe you forgot what... The devil himself said to Jesus Christ when he said that the world had been delivered to him and he has the power to give the kingdoms to whomever he wills. Maybe we're forgetting what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, when it says, if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. This demon was saying, we win, you lose. You cannot have her. We are in control. And my friend at that point says, that's not true. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of the world. He has conquered. And he looks at the girl and he says to her, do you want to be set free? Do you want to be released from the power of this demon? And she said, I need Jesus Christ. And they cast, he cast the demon out of her. We do have authority in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it gives you some insight into the power of the wicked one. There is a tremendous numbing power that, that this world has been seduced by. We're living in a day that it shows that. It shows that. And we, we, we don't even see it. I was on, on a plane flying home just this morning, on a plane, and they, they give you a selection of any movies you want to watch. And so Marie and I are s sitting there. It says comedy. And, and so, it's, you know, they have these, these screens on, on the seat in front of you. And so I, I put on a comedy. And the first thing that you hear is, is, is vile profanity. And it's, it's, it's a, a supposed to be comedy. And Marie turns and looks at me, and I look at her, and we change the channel. So I go to another comedy, supposedly. The next thing I see, see is almost identical to the first. And then I, I realize, you know, I'm not going to be watching anything because that's all, you, that's all they had, just profanity and filth. And this is on an airplane, and, and any kid can be watching this. And, and any, any kid can watch it. Just you got $2 for the headset, you can put it on. And it's numbing. This, this world that we live in is mind-numbing. Proposition 8 passes, but do the people who are opposing it, do they say, well, we lost? No, they're in the streets the next day. 
They're still marching and they're angry like they have the right to have whatever they want whenever they want. And if you don't agree with me, I, you're supposed to tolerate me, but I don't have to tolerate you because you're filled with hate and you're filled with violence and you're filled with evil. And all of us saw that, 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 that uh, news broadcast, perhaps you didn't, of that older woman there carrying a cross through the midst of these protesters as they're hitting her, knocking the cross down. These are the tolerant ones that we're, we are the ones who are filled with hate, right? We are the ones who are filled with hate. This is the world that we're living in. Where do you think this energy comes from, guys? It's demonic. It's demonic. It's a demonic power, and it's in front of us. And you know what people are thinking? Oh, man, this guy's preaching like a Middle Ages preacher. Come on, we're sophisticated. We know that's not demonic because Freud taught us it's just a mental problem. Well, I follow the teachings of a Jewish man, but it's not Freud, it's Jesus Christ. And Jesus made it very clear that it's demonic. You don't see it just in the, in, in the, the New Testament gospels, this demonic possession and all. Luke speaks various times concerning the reality of de demons. Uh, we see it in Luke chapter 8 with um, man of the Gadarenes, demon possessed. We see it in Luke chapter 9, uh, verse 42, uh, when there's a possessed child there that he speaks about. We see it in, in chapter 11, verse 14, when Jesus casts a mute and, and deaf uh, spirit out of a man. You see it in the, in the early church. You see the apostle Paul as he cast out demons. You see that in Acts chapter 16, verse 18, where, where the apostle Paul cast out the spirit of divination from a slave girl. You see it in, in Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, through the unique miracles that God wrought through the hands of the apostle Paul, and, and that included uh, demon uh, spirits being cast out. You, you see an interesting passage in, in, in Acts 19 with the story of, of, of Sceva and his seven sons and how they were, he was a Jewish exorcist who, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, tried to cast a demon demon out of a man, and the demonized man leapt upon him and, and beat him and his sons up. But the, the demonized man said, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but you, I don't know. And, and it's almost a humorous story if it weren't so frightening as you think of what that must have really felt like when that was going on. You see demons in Scripture, and I believe very strongly that we still have demons, and we still have demons around that God wants to deal with. I, I have no doubt in my mind about that. And the gospel is intended to set captives free, including those who've been demonized. He goes on in verse 8, and he says, freely you have received, freely give. When he was teaching them that, and we'll see this again in just a moment, he's reminding them of this. When he was teaching them that, he said, listen, the way that you are to take my word out is to include no thought about personal gain. You see, it is true then as it is true now, false teachers got ri rich off the ministry. They would rip people off. But Jesus' ministers are to minister freely. They're to do so with a pure heart. In, in Matthew 23, verse 14, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. You rip people off. In 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul said, We are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God. We speak in the sight of God in Christ. Freely you received, freely give. Many years ago now, we were invited when our church was young to be part of an outreach that was going to take place in the city of, of Chino. And it was going to be... Um, you know, a large outreach to the city. And, and so a pastor in the area had contacted several churches and asked if we would meet with him as he, he kind of laid out his, his vision for an outreach. And, and, and so I wanted to, to hear what he had to say. Perhaps we would be involved in all. And so I went to the meeting and, and um, it was an interesting meeting without going into much detail about it. It was an interesting meeting. And as I came and sat down with these other pastors and all, they began to speak concerning what he wanted to do and how he wanted to reach and, and all of that. They wanted to use the stadium and, and, and began to kind of lay things out. And, and I was listening and all. And then finally he turns and he asks me, uh, well, first he says, look, he goes, we're going to need to, to, it's going to need to be sponsored. He says, and, and David, could you tell us uh, what your idea is related to receiving an offering at this outreach? 
And, and I smiled at him, and I, and I said, no, I don't think I'm the person you should ask about that. You know, and he says, oh, okay. And so he looks to somebody else, and I said, no, wait a minute, let me, let me, let me tell you what, what I mean by that. I said, listen, and I looked, and there were something like five, six churches, seven of us, all together. I said, the outreach is going to cost $30,000. 30, I said, there are enough churches here represented for us to pay for this for free. And we could do it without receiving an offering. Why do you have to receive an offering? Why don't we just combine uh, finances and pay for it ourselves? And... Um, and this one guy says, well, last year he said we did an outreach and somebody walked by and right when they were given, um, asking for an offering, he said, one of them turned and said, um, this kid said, I knew nothing's free. And so he said, and I said under my breath, then get out of here if you're not willing to pay for it. And I remember turning to him and I said, listen, something is free. The gospel of Jesus Christ is free. Salvation is free. And we ought to be giving this, 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 this outreach, being involved in this outreach. We ought to do it for free. Freely we have uh, received. Freely we are to give. We're, we're not to be going out there trying to make money uh, off of uh, uh, outreaches. So the pastor who is putting it together turns to me and says, we're not charging them for the, uh, for the, for the outreach itself. We're, we're, we're charging them for the fireworks. It was going to be a fireworks display. And I said, so what you're doing is you're, you're charging the fish for the bait that you want to catch them with. I, I think it's wrong. And I think what you're doing is wrong. So we weren't invited to the next meeting. Obviously, we weren't involved in that. But I believe that with all of my heart. I really do. And, and that's what Jesus is teaching them. He's teaching them, listen, when you are evangelizing, you need to learn something. Your heart has to be pure and your motives have to be, be right. And so he says in verses 9 and 10, and then we're going to actually go to Luke and look at that passage. So he says in verse 9, Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journeys, nor uh, two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs. A worker is worthy of his food. And so he's basically saying this, this is the principle I want to train you in. Trust God. Trust God to meet your basic need. You see, ministers are not to demand finances, but they are cared for by the community they minister to. A Jewish rabbi by the name of Jachanan said this, he said, it is the duty of every Jewish community to support a rabbi, and the more so because a rabbi naturally neglects his own affairs to concentrate on the affairs of God. And Paul would echo a sentiment in 1 Timothy 5.18 when he says, you must not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. The laborer is worthy of his wages. And so he's teaching them to trust the Lord. They go out in faith, but trust God. Now, getting back to Luke 22, we can now look at the context that's been developed and apply it to the verses in front of us. Because in Luke 22, verse 35, he said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. In other words, as you are recalling your early training and as you're drawing upon the lessons learned, did God fully provide for you or not? Well, their past experience is intended to lead them to put confidence in him and in God. So their answer is nothing. We, we lacked nothing. In other words, God provided for us in every way. Like Psalm 23, 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. God has a way of providing for us in all of our needs. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, Paul said, God's able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Or like Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Yes, we had all things provided. No, we lacked nothing. Well, that was how I initially taught you, but now I want to share with you something that's going to take place. Verse 36, he says, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And he who has no sword, 
Let him sell his garment and buy one. Now, is this a contradiction? Is he undermining their earlier training? No, the point is, times are changing. Your original mission was short-term, but you are now going to the entire known world. Therefore, you, you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared for long journeys, and you need to be prepared for certain dangers. There are going to be dangers and trials. They're going to have uh, danger among strangers. You're going to have enemies, and you're going to have great needs. So you need to be ready and properly prepared for this. And you need to make proper plans for these provisions. When he says they're to take a money bag, it's another way of simply saying you need to be prepared for any needs that you encounter while on the road. You need to be ready for these things. And, and to have a money bag, to, to have finances and to be supported while in a mission became a very common practice in the early church. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians makes reference to that in chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. He says, my defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? The early church would support. You need to have a means of support, and therefore he's saying to them, be ready, because as you go forth, you're going to need to be ready with the provisions. He says something in verse 36 that's interesting. He who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now, again, this is interesting. I'll take a moment to look at this with you. Is Jesus teaching conversion by the sword? There are those who point to the Scripture and say that he is. That's the reason I bring it up. Is he teaching conversion by the sword? Islam is known for that. Was the early church supposed to do that? There are those who point to such historic events as the Crusades and say, well, look what they did. They tried to force people into conversion by the sword. Is that what Jesus was teaching? No, of course not. Jesus didn't teach that because all you need to do is cross-reference this kind of thought with other thoughts that he's given to us related to that, and you'll see that it's not possible that he'd be saying, I want you to convert by the sword. You can see that in John 18, verse 36, when Jesus is there before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, and, and he's speaking concerning his kingdom, and, and Jesus in John 18, 36 says, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So Jesus is not saying that there should be conversion by the sword. So then what is he doing? When he says that you need to have a sword, what is a sword? A sword is a means of defense. And so that gives us insight. What he's saying is I'm sending you as, as sheep amongst wolves. I am sending you into the midst of danger. You're going to go out into a country that is infested with robbers and, and wild beasts. So you need to be armed in order that you might be able to protect yourself. You need to be prepared in the most usual way to meet those, those kinds of events. Your, your manner of life is going to be changed. And so you need the provisions appropriate to that kind of life. And so when he says you have a sword, it's just another way of saying you're entering into dangerous times and just be prepared. But uh, for those of you who might find this interesting, this also reveals that self-defense is permitted because when you are surrounded by danger, you may lawfully defend your life. Uh, I'll get in trouble for this one, but I'll say it briefly. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to say it. Uh, I'm not a pacifist. I heard a, I heard a true pacifist once, pacifist who says violence is never the answer. I heard a true pacifist one time on a, a radio talk show, a Christian guy who's a pacifist, and the question was asked of him, is there ever an appropriate time to respond to force with force? That's a good question. He's a pacifist. And uh, he said, never. So the guy said, let me give you a hypothetical. You're a married man? Yes, I am. A man is attacking, harming your wife, and he does so in front of you. What do you do? 
His answer, I pray for him as he's attacking her. My answer, <laughs> I pray for him as I'm attacking him. <laughs> you, know, you know, that's just the way it is, you know. Ooh, you must be tired, Pastor. You're mean. <laughs> no, he'd probably kill me, but I'd rather die than my wife. I think greater love is to lay down your life if you need to. And, and I am I'm one who really believes very strongly in, in protecting. It's a great love when you are actually caring for that one who is being harmed. And, and, and there are some, the only reason I'm bringing this up, by the way, isn't because I like to talk like that. I don't, actually. It's because there are some who are confused about that. Pastor, what if someone's harming my child? What if I see somebody harming somebody else? I don't know what to do. Well, you have to do what is responsible and safest, but you need to do what you need to do. And if that means you get involved and you get hurt or somebody else gets hurt, then, then so be it. I mean, that, that you have to do. There's a greater love principle involved in that. And so bottom line is, is, yes, I do believe that the Scripture teaches that there is a time of peace, but there is also a time of war. There is a time when you turn the other cheek, but, but there's other times when you need to defend yourself. And so in these dangerous times, Jesus was saying you're to be equipped in the event that there may be a moment of a need for a defense. Now, he is, he's wanting to make it very clear, and by the way, and I have to make this point, it's not that Jesus is saying, okay, so we are now Christian militia, we'll go out with our swords and lop people's heads off. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is, you are about to enter in to a dangerous place, be prepared for dangers. That's what he's saying. You have to be prepared for the dangers. Now, that's why he says in verse uh, 36, let him sell his garment and buy a sword. In other words, be prepared at any expense. Why? Because the danger is not only great, but the danger that you're going to encounter is also going to be continuous. And so, in verse 37, continuing, he says, I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. So when he says in verse 37, this that is written has to be accomplished, he, he's applying Isaiah 53 verse 12 to himself as the one uh, spoken of as fulfilling God's plan of salvation. And uh, there he is, he's, he's reckoned amongst transgressors. Now, I want you to see this. It says he was numbered with the transgressors. It doesn't say that he is a transgressor, but he was treated as one. He was put to death in their company. He was treated as if he had been a transgressor. But that simply means that Jesus identified with sinful man, and he died on that cross accomplishing redemption. So as he's sharing that with them and he's saying this is still to take place, he's preparing them for what's going to take place. He says the things concerning me have an end. I'm going to uh, fulfill this prophecy. Their response in verse 38 is, uh, Lord, look, here are two swords. He said to them, it's enough. Now, there are 11 faithful apostles and they took an inventory. Okay, how many of us have swords? We got two of them. And I suspect, <laughs> I suspect at that point, well, when he says it is enough, Jesus is saying, you know what, this, we've talked enough. He, 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 he's in, that's a kind way, I think, of saying, shut up. You, <laughs> you're missing the point. It's not like I'm saying, oh, we, you need 11 swords. What I'm saying to you is you're going to go into the midst of danger, be prepared for it, and what you're doing is counting how many swords you have. So you're missing my point. My point is be prepared. My point is when I sent you out before, and you remember in Matthew 10 how we did, I did that, how I gave you all of this to do. You remember that? You remember how, how my father took care of you every step of the way? 
You do? Fine. Well, what I'm trying to remind you of is, is the fact that he has always taken care of you, but you need to be prepared because you're going to be there for the long haul, and that's what I'm trying to share with you. When I say to you that you need a sword, yes, you're going to go into a dangerous world, and yeah, there'll be times that perhaps it would be appropriate if you had to use it, but that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is be ready for the long haul. And so what you're doing in the midst of a, of a training to teach you of the dangers that you're about to enter into and the need that you have to be prepared, you're taking me literally in the sense that you're thinking that every one of you should have a sword. You took a sword inventory, you have two, and therefore you think you've got plenty. You missed the whole point. And I have to tell you, I have done that myself in Bible studies, and I've done that myself when the Lord is trying to minister something to me, and I'm thinking, oh, yes, Lord, I get it. And he's saying, no, you don't. We'll come back to this later on. No, you didn't get exactly what I meant. You see, some of the lessons that you learn, you learn several times over until there are layers of lessons and you have depth to that lesson. Sometimes you think the first time you read a scripture, you understand it, and then the Lord shows you that there are layers of meaning that apply to your life that give you depths and dimensions of maturity that later on you can look back at and you can drop a, a bucket into and you can pull out rich understanding because you understand that passage because you've lived it now for 30 years. And that's what happened. It's like, the guy, it's like me when I first started teaching on raising kids, and my kids were four years old. And I stood up telling everybody, this is how you do it. Yeah, we're a four-year-old, and then I have a 15-year-old, and then we had four teenagers at one time. I earned my scars. <laughs> and now I can look back and I can say, mm, this is what we did. Wish I wouldn't have done that. Wish I would have done this. I've gained some experience. And, and you learn through practice and you learn to apply things over time. And so as Jesus is speaking here, he's saying to them, that's enough. We'll leave this here. You don't understand fully what I'm trying to say, but you will later on. One day you will. And for me, that's proven to be a wonderful, wonderful encouragement because I don't always get it the first time the Lord tries to teach me. But my hope is that eventually I do. And I think we do, eventually. Probably when we're in heaven. And we say, oh, that's what that meant. Probably. <laughs>